name is Svetlana Sakova. I'm a developer advocate at JetBrains. And today I want to talk about Kotlin. Kotlin is a modern and pragmatic language. And today I want to discuss what do we understand by these terms, modern and pragmatic, and why it makes a difference when we use it in real life. Now, there are already many people using Kotlin. More than two million developers already use Kotlin for their projects. Kotlin started at 2010, and uh, it took it six years to reach its first stable release. It's a lot of time, so m many concepts were battle tested, were tried in real life to see what works, what doesn't work. And in the end, we have really pragmatic, good result. And Google acknowledged Kotlin as a first-class citizen on Android, which boosted their adoption of Kotlin. Who of you are here Android developers? And uh, server-side developers? OK, thank you. So we have both groups present today. And uh, after a Google announcement, it really helped to increase the adoption, especially on Android. Some people may think that Kotlin is mainly for Android. That's not true. Kotlin was initially designed as better Java language, so it works for all the use cases that Java solves, both Android and server-side development. And now it's not only JVM or Android. We also can compile Kotlin to JavaScript and to Kotlin native. I will touch this topic briefly at the end of my talk. Next, I'm going to focus mainly on Kotlin JVM. So now we're going to mainly talk about Kotlin and compare it with Java. So Kotlin tries to be really pragmatic language, practical language, good for real life tasks. Not some language from academia, from research, just uses features and functionality that work good in real life. For us, that means two major things. First, it has really good tooling support. Kotlin is language from JetBrains, the creator of IntelliJ IDEA and many other IDEs for different languages. And at JetBrains, we believe that tooling is important. It helps a lot while using a language, while writing a code. So for Kotlin, you can expect really good tooling support from JetBrains, and it's indeed the case. Most of the things that you already have, that you already use for Java, work the same way for Kotlin. Completion, navigation, refactorings, different inspections and intentions that help you improve the Kotlin code, that all works for Kotlin. Another characteristic of Kotlin that makes it pragmatic language is good interoperability with Java. You can easily mix in one project Kotlin and Java code. And it really helped people to start using Kotlin. You don't have to rewrite your application entirely to change your application. You can add Kotlin to existing Java code very slow and smoothly. Kotlin is compiled to Java bytecode, so it's no surprise that you can call Java code from Kotlin, but that also works in a convenient way in another direction. You can code Kotlin code from Java code without a problem. And that makes it really easy to add Kotlin to your existing application. You don't need to rewrite everything from scratch to create a new 
application to create a new project. If you have existing Java code, you can very slowly add Kotlin to it. And that's the experience of many teams that successfully use Kotlin. They just add it slowly, bit by bit. There is no need to convert everything. You can just, if something works, let it work. There is no rush, but you can add new functionality and Kotlin and use it from Java. It works. And that is really important benefit of Kotlin for Java developers, for those who are consider migration. It costs almost nothing to migrate and to add new stuff in Kotlin. This way, people from the team can very slowly get used to new language. Another important aspect of Kotlin is it it's being a modern language. What do I mean by this? Mostly I here compare it with Java and with some other modern languages like Swift. So compare, compare, in comparison with Java, we can say that Kotlin is a modern language. It means three things for me. It's concise, safe, and expressive. And now I want to highlight different features of the language to illustrate these three points, these three ideas. At first, concise. Why do we need a language to be concise? Because we spend much more time actually reading the code rather than writing the code. If you need to fix some problem in the application, you spend a lot of time trying to find the exact place where the problem occurs, trying to understand the code written by someone else. So it is really important if the language is readable, if the language helps us to write readable code. And Kotlin is good at it. Classical introduction to Kotlin example. This is Java class that just stores the data. There is no logic. However, in Java you have to write a lot of code to express this simple idea. There is class, two fields, constructor, two getters. Hope that you generate this code, not write it by hand. But still, when you read it, you have to cope with verbosity, with excessive syntax. And in Kotlin, you can do better. You can convert this Java file to Kotlin automatically. There is automatic Java to Kotlin converter. And it is a really helpful tool for mig migrations and for learning the language. So if you are new, if you just start using Kotlin, you can always write code in Java and convert it to Kotlin automatically. It doesn't always produce the best result, but it still helps you to see what this, how the same code looks like in Kotlin. When we apply this conversion, it gives us much more concise result. And this is not unique to Kotlin. Most of the modern languages share this idea when you can declare the class in a very simple and concise way. Unfortunately, in Java, you still have to write all this excessive boilerplate code. In Kotlin, under the hood, it's the same class, the same two fields, constructor and two getters. So if you want to add some custom logic, it's possible. But for simple cases, and such simple cases are quite often, the code looks really concise. You can add one keyword, data, and that will convert the class to a data class and generate a bunch of useful methods. 
So you don't need to write by hand equals hash code and to string. They all can be generated by the compiler. It works only for data classes. Another example of applying Java to Kotlin conversion for Java function, I will illustrate how this conversion works. So here we have a function that does a very simple thing. It updates two variables. So it updates weather depending on degrees, and it updates description and color, color variable. We have three values of color that we are interested in. It's very simple and straightforward code in Java. It just checks the values and assigns the corresponding result. Nothing complicated. We can convert this code to Kotlin automatically. And we see that the produced result looks very similar to initial Java code. And that often works this way. When you convert Java to Kotlin automatically, the result looks like regular Java code. We have different function for uh, keyword for function, fun. We have different syntax for variable declarations, val. But other than that, the code is very understandable and similar. Also, the types stay on the right for Kotlin variables and parameters. But generally, usually it's quite clear what's going on in comparison to Java. However, we often can improve the result of the conversion. And here I will illustrate how it can be done. At first, we can replace the repetitive variable name. So here we have to duplicate the variable name four times. In Kotlin, we can just assign the result of pair to two variables immediately. That's a small change. However, it slightly improves readability because now the result is shorter. The next simplification that I can do is connected with the types. Kotlin is a statically typed language. That means every expression, every variable has the type. However, the types can be inferred by the compiler. So here, the types are clear from the context, and we can omit them. The compiler infers automatically that the type of description is string and the type of color is color. Next thing we can apply here is we can replace if expression with when expression. Here you see also another difference. In Kotlin, if returns the result of the expression, which you can assign to variable or to several variables. Now we replace if with when. We can do it automatically. And that's our result. It does the same thing as before, but it's a bit more concise syntax. When is analog of switch in Java, but is it is more powerful in Kotlin than in Java. So for instance, here you use when without argument, and it checks all the conditions. If the condition is satisfied, then it returns the corresponding result. If this next condition is satisfied, it returns the result. So that is the result of our conversion. You see that we applied several changes, and the result looks mostly the same, but a bit different, a bit shorter, and when you get used to Kotlin, a bit more clear, a bit more concise. And this example, this small example, illustrates how conversion often works for Java code. So you have a Java class, you convert it, 
you somehow probably apply some improvements, and after that, your code now is more concise and is shorter. That often works with Java to Kotlin converter. It also demonstrates that at first the converter produces not the best result, not the most idiomatic code, but you then can improve it by hand or just when you write the code from scratch, you get used to it and use more idiomatic Kotlin. So that was my first point, my first story. And then I want to move on and talk about safety. And to illustrate this point, I want to talk about another classical example of why Kotlin is great for in comparison to Java, and it is the story about nullability. The problem, we have exception, null pointer exception. We click on details, unfortunately there are no details, it's just null pointer exception, not enough information to understand what's going on. You have to go back, investigate which reference stores null, what was the source of the problem, and it is a known problem in Java and in other languages that use the same concept, and Sir Tony Hoare, the inventor of null reference back in, I don't know, 70s or 80s, he called now, he co recently he called his invention billion dollar mistake because it's hard to count how much money overall was spent on fixing these exceptions. So this is common problem that modern languages try to fix. What is the solution of Java 8, for instance, for this problem? Option type, correct. And uh, so Java 8 or Scala, they provide option types for this problem and their general approach shared by Kotlin and many other languages nowadays is to prevent null pointer exception when we write code rather than at runtime. So we want compilation errors rather than runtime exceptions. So that is common approach that shares Kotlin and other languages. And Kotlin has a different solution to this called nullable types. And I will discuss what it is and how it is different and from our perspective better than optional. In Kotlin, if you want to store a, ver a value in a variable, you define a regular type, string, or user type, or some other type. But then you cannot store null reference in such a variable, in such type. It's forbidden. If you want to store null references in variable, you have to use so-called nullable type, they're just the type name and then question mark. And nullable types can, so every type can be nullable, your custom types can also be not nullable or nullable. In nullable type, you can store null or regular expressions. Then, if you try to access a property or a function of a value of regular non-nullable type, everything is fine. It is allowed because no null pointer exception is possible. However, if you try to dereference variable of nullable type, the Kotlin compiler generates error saying that no, it's not allowed. You should check whether this variable is not null. What you can do here? You can check explicitly that variable is not null, and if it is the case, the reference access the property or the function. Or you can do better. IntelliJ suggests you to 
replace this code automatically with so-called safe access expression. So the result looks like question mark dot. It's the way to access property or member function in a safe manner. It means exactly like this if. So it is equivalent code. Safe access returns the value if receiver string is not null and returns null if it's null. So it's a safe way to get nullable value as a result. Note that the type of the result will also be nullable since it can store null references inside. If you want to provide default value for the case when your expression is null, you can do it by using another so-called Elvis operator that says if the left expression is null, return this value. This safe access and Elvis operators are not the Kotlin invention. They were already present in Groovy before, and they were proven to be very useful. So that's something that is reused from other languages because it, it's, uh, the experience showed that these operators are really helpful when you write the code. And Kotlin just reuses them from experience, from other experience. If you want, you can throw null pointer exception explicit. For this, you use this two exclamation marks operator. That means throw null pointer exception if this variable is null. So here you can dereference it in this way. However, the recommended way to work with nullable types is to use safe operators. So very rarely when the compiler is not smart enough to infer the type of the variable, you can use these exclamation marks, but in general, it's better to use safe operators to avoid the possibility, to avoid the problem of null pointer exception. So the recommended way is to use safe operators. Now, about the difference with option type. Nullable types under the hood are implemented using annotations. So they are just annotations on the types. And that means there is no performance overhead when using nullable types. At runtime, nullable string and string both are just one object, are just one string. There is no wrapper. In contrary, optional type is a wrapper. When you use optional, when you create an optional, you always create an extra object. You always allocate an extra object to store the value. With nullable types, it's not the case. Because they are just annotations under the hood, at runtime there is no performance overhead, all the checks are going on at the compilation time. So that is important benefit of Kotlin annotations. You can ask what happens when you mix Kotlin and Java code and the answer is that if you just use Java types, if you just call Java functions, then you still not uh, save from null pointer exceptions. Java types behaves like regular Java types. So at first we tried different approaches, but this one turned out to be the most pragmatic one. However, you can annotate your Java types specifying which type can store null references and which type can't store null references. And then Kotlin interprets the type accordingly. Also, we can pick up default. 
So you can say, in my Java code, all types are nullable. Or in my Java code base, all types by default are not null. And then Kotlin will interpret, will work with them accordingly. So there is some, there are some ways how to cope with mixed Kotlin and Java projects. And you will find out that Kotlin generates, like if because of Java, some null goes somewhere, then Kotlin throws clear messages what went wrong. So even if it runtime exception, it's an exception with clear message. So overall, these nullable types provide really pragmatic solution to the problem of nullability. If it's just Kotlin without Java, you are totally safe from null pointer exceptions. If it's mixed project, there is some pragmatic, convenient way to cope with it in real life scenarios. So that was all for my second part of this story about safety, about nullable types. And now I move on to talk about expressiveness of the language and what does it mean for us. Our goal here is to allow more code reuse. So we want to avoid any sort of duplication in the code base and try to extract patterns into functions, into libraries, as much as possible so that uh, there was no minimum duplication in the code. And that means for us avoid repetition, duplication. The c overall code looks nicer and more pleasant to work with in comparison to Java. And also you can create API that look like domain-specific languages so you can create better API, better interfaces. And now I want to highlight also several features illustrating this point. At first, I want to talk about extension functions. As safe operators for working with nullability, this feature wasn't Kotlin invention. This time, it was already present in C Sharp for a long time and proved to be quite useful there. So Kotlin tries to reuse what already works in other languages and bring it to JVM platform to static type language. The idea of an extension function is that you can define a function outside of the class, it's not a member, it's def uh, defined somewhere, not inside the class, and you can use it as a member. So it's just syntactic feature, it's just syntactic way to use these functions, but it turns out to be really convenient. So here we defined this function outside of the string class, and we can access it in the completion list and use it as a member, like it was a member function. But in fact, it is extension function. Talking about string in Java, I think that every team uses some kind of string extensions, string utility functions, because there are many methods missing in standard Java string like this last character, convenient methods, and many people create their own utility class for utility functions for string and use this uh, inside their projects or use some external utility libraries. In Kotlin case, all these functions can be defined as extensions and it's much more nicer, much more convenient to use them. When you define an extension function, you can use this reference that refers 
to the receiver of this function. So string is the receiver, and you can use this receiver inside the string via this reference. As usual, for this reference, it can be emitted, and you can just access members of string without explicit specification. So again, it's very much syntactic feature. You just add additional extra parameter to your function, call it receiver, and access it inside via this reference, but it turns out to be really powerful and convenient feature. How would you define such extension, such utility function for string class in Java? If we are talking about Java code and you want to define last char function there, how would you define it? I think you would just define it as a static function that, does, that takes string as a first parameter, right? And that is exactly what happens under the hood. So under the hood, this, ch this last char function is compiled to a static function in class that corresponds to file name that takes string as a first parameter. So under the hood, it's like old Java, but in Kotlin, you can use it with nice, more convenient syntax. And I've told you that it is very easy to mix Kotlin and Java, and it also illustrates that you define extension function in Kotlin, and you can just call it from Java. It just works. Another question. What do you think? Is it possible to call a private member of string here from extension function? Who thinks it's possible? Who thinks it's not possible? Who prefer not to think? All the rest, okay, <laughs> but you don't tell it. You're, you're right, it's not possible. Under the hood, it's a regular static Java method, and from method defined outside of the class, you can't access private members. So the same rule applies to Kotlin. If you understand what what's going on, there is direct correspondence with Java. Very similar. So that's why it's very easy to, con uh, to start using Kotlin when you're a Java developer, because you, you understand the logic and very similar rules apply, and the compiler just hides some verbosity. So that's really beneficial. Another thing I want to mention is lambdas. I hope that you already use Java 8 and are familiar with lambdas. Are you familiar with lambdas? Yes, yes, so I won't introduce uh, this concept, just sh highlight that lambdas in Kotlin have a little bit different syntax. They are always put in curly braces, unlike Java. And to distinguish lambdas from regular curly braces in blocks, IntelliJ or Android Studio highlights lambda curly braces in bold. So if you see bold curly braces, that means lambda. Kotlin supports the same set of operators for working with collection in functional style, like for streams, stream API in Java 8. So here you can use filter map functions that take lambda as argument and return this one, filters the collection, map transforms the collection, and so on. I won't go deep into details here. That's just exactly the same concepts as in other languages. Here is the long form of lambda. Here I just use the short one, access lambda parameter 
using it variable. I just want to highlight that all these functions are defined as extensions. Kotlin does not re-implement standard library. Kotlin uses Java standard collection libraries, like list, map, set. If you use list in Kotlin at runtime, under the hood, it's just Java util list. Kotlin provides different views on it read-only and mutable list, but under the hood, it's the same collections. And that also explains why so good, why we have so good interoperability with Java. Because the collection interfaces are the same. You don't have to convert list to different list. They are the same interface, the same list under the hood. And all these operations are defined as extension functions on standard collections on standard Java collections. And that showcase why it was so beneficial for you, for Android usages before Java 8. So all these extensions worked starting from Java 6, even before stream API was introduced, was possible for Java, that, that in Kotlin it worked for older versions on, uh, of Java using extension methods. So Kotlin library is basically a set of extensions on standard Java collections. Kotlin library does not re-implement stand, uh, standard collections. It just uses Java once under the hood. Now I want to highlight another important feature, and that is very simple idea. We have extension function, which we can look at as function with receiver. So it's just function with additional receiver. And we have the concept of lambdas. Now let's mix the two concepts and have lambda with receiver as a result. Let's discuss what this lambda with receiver is used for. I will start with a simple example. Here we have string builder. That's a typical Java code, code similar to Java. It's in, it's in Kotlin, but we can write the same in any language. We create string builder. We append some arguments to it, some strings, and we convert it to string as a result. You do it very often in Java. But we have this repetition. We have to repeat variable name for several times. It's not a big deal, especially in slides, when I have a very short name. In real life, I suppose it would be called string builder. And it's kind of verbosity. You have to, especially when you read the code, you, ha you see all this repetitive variable name, and we know how to do better in modern languages. You can write something like this. You can use with variable name, and after that you access members of string builder without any receiver, just inside this block you access members. And in some languages it is language feature. For instance, in Python, they have such feature. However, in Kotlin, it's not a language feature. It's a regular function defined in the library. So interesting thing from this slide is its title, the with function. With is a regular function. How it works? With is a function that takes two arguments. The first one is variable, string builder. The second argument is lambda. In Kotlin, uh, there is syntactic convention, borrowed also from Groovy, that if lambda is the last argument, it can be 
moved out of parentheses. Another way to write this code is to pass lambda as a second argument explicitly. You just use comma and lambda. However, it's not that readable, and now it doesn't look like built-in feature. Option works better. And this is an implicit receiver inside this lambda. So as fa extension function is just function with additional this receiver inside its body, lambda with receiver is lambda with additional this receiver inside its body, inside, inside lambda itself. As usual, for this reference, it can be emitted, like in extension functions, and you see the result. It looks like built-in language construct, it looks like special feature, but it's just a function. With this very simple thing, it just calls lambda, passing string builder as its receiver. So with, simp with function implementation, is really straightforward. You just call the lambda body, passing the first argument as this. Under the hood, lambdas can be inlined, and that means there is no performance overhead when you using with function. You could probably define similar function in Java. However, then different style guides would say, try not to use this function in a performance critical code because you create lambda in comparison to just writing this code explicitly. So there, is, there would be performance overhead because of lambda of creating an extra object. But with in Kotlin, it's not the case. So here we have example, class window, with three properties. And we initialize this variable. We initialize uh, window assigning values to these properties. We use with. Because this function, with function, is declared as inline function. Under the hood, the generated bytecode is just the same as writing this code by hand. There is no performance overhead for creating a lambda. So that's why in Kotlin, it's so easy to write functions that look like built-in constructs, and it's cheap to use such functions because no overhead. That is really beneficial. Another similar function, apply function, it applies the given actions and returns receiver as a result. Apply is extension, so we call it on expression, we call it as, a, as an extension function. And in this case, what we do, we access map, window by ID is some map that stores, that uh, has, uses strings as keys and stores some windows. So we uh, get main window by ID. Then if it's not null, we use safe access here. We apply the given action to this window and return it as a result, assign it to a variable. If it's null, then we can return here or we can create new window in this line to assign it to, to the variable. So it illustrates Kotlin syntax. It illustrates, you see, I use different functions, different features of Kotlin that we've covered. It showcases nullable types and this apply function, and it all makes Kotlin code more readable and more concise and more expressive. Now, a couple of words about 
domain-specific languages. Turns out that this Lambda with receiver functionality works really well with, is very beneficial for creating DSLs. I will use HTML example because everyone is familiar with HTML, with basics of HTML. So it's easy to see what's happening here. So instead of HTML tags, now we have some Kotlin code that looks like HTML, but it mixes the tags and code. And you can see here that I have different types of curly braces. So these ones are from lambdas, and this one is not in bold, it's for, for loop. And you can indeed create this framework, Cater, and there you can use the library for creating HTML in such code, in such style. You just write, you just use Kotlin syntax for creating HTML uh, pages, and it will return you, generate the page, and return it as a result. Interesting he thing here is it all works because of lambdas with receiver. Here, all these curly braces are lambdas with receiver, and you can, the HTML is function invocation that takes lambda with receiver as argument, and inside this lambda, you can call table on implicit receiver of this lambda, and so on. This one is lambda with receiver, and you can call these methods on this, inside this lambda. So you can find more about this pattern. It works not only for HTML, but any XML-like structure, and many more use cases. For instance, you know Gradle now writes build scripts, allows to write build scripts in Kotlin, and they created, they recreated their DSL in Kotlin, and they also use this functionality of Lambda with receiver. So here, when I say dependencies, dependencies is a function, takes Lambda with receiver as argument, and you can call methods of, of implicit receiver inside. So it turns out to be a really powerful feature of the language. Looks like some syntactic thing, just lambda with additional parameter, but turns out to be really powerful. Spring Boot now have some experiments of using Kotlin, and um, they provide more Kotlin support, including coroutines, which we're going to discuss afterwards, but they also use this concept of lambda with receiver a lot. So this lambda with receiver works for all types of better APIs, DSLs, for different libraries and frameworks. So here we create routing table, and this nest function also takes lambda with receiver as an argument. I don't go into details here, it's just for illustration of the concept of Lambda with receiver that it's really powerful. So now I think we still have some time, yes? And I want to highlight briefly one impo other important thing, new, new thing about Kotlin. It's the ability to create multi-platform projects. So what I was talking so far about so far uh, is part of the stable language already in use for many use cases. This multi-platform story is so far experimental. It's in experimental state. However, some people already use it and are satisfied with it. So I will just share the basic introduction to this story. So w w we, Kotlin, now wants to solve 
the problem that exists for a long time already, the problem of sharing the code between different platforms. So now every team, ha every company has two different teams, one for iOS development, the other for Android development, and they don't share any code in between. They are just two separate systems, two separate code bases. There is no shared code. Also, there is a story about sharing code between server side and browser, so that we could share some business logic between them, or even sharing the code between all the players. And Kotlin tries to be helpful in solving this problem of sharing code and provide its own solution for, share, for ability to share code between different platforms. So Kotlin code can be compiled to Kotlin JVM, which is now already in use in many cases, but also you can compile Kotlin to native code in order to run on iOS or to JavaScript to run in browser. So, and that can be the same Kotlin code, the same common code, the part that we can share. The approach that Kotlin takes to this problem is different to, to the solutions that were before because Kotlin does not want to share all the code. There is no goal to, sh to have one application, to, have, to share everything. There is no goal to have one application that runs on Android and on iOS, no. The goal is to share only some part, to share only business logic, for instance, and keep many other parts platform dependent. So UI should be platform dependent, it really depends on the platform, and basically you can vary you can, de it, it depends what part of the code you want to share. And Kotlin solution makes it possible to easily adjust what parts you want to be, share, to be shared. How it works. So you can write some common code that can theoretically work for each platform. In this common code, you definitely will find something that should be, should be platform specific. And for that, you can define expect declarations in the common code, just declarations, and provide different implementations, actual implementations on different platforms. For example, we have, let's say we define function measure time, and we provide only its declaration mark, marked with expect. Now we have expect fun. After, after that, you can already use this function from the common code. You only provided declaration, but you already use this function when you write your, co your shared business logic. And then, to be able to compile common code for different platforms, you will need to provide different implementations on these functions depending on the platform. So for Kotlin JVM, it, our measure time function might use system nanotime. For Android, it might be different measuring for native, it will be something else. And for JavaScript, it will be some JavaScript specific API. So that's how you can share some logic, but be able to easily adjust what depends on the platform. And this way you can easily move from platform independent code, you find something that depends on the platform, you extract it into this expect function and provide different actual implementations. So this is quite customizable solution. 
that quite powerful with which you can easily change which parts you want to share and which parts you don't want to share. So when you write such common code, it uses the standard library. It can use the standard library. The standard library is already, uh, is already multi-platform library. It can be compiled to different platforms. So we have implementations for JavaScript and for native. You can define expect declarations and use them. And you can use, from common code, you can use other multi-platform libraries. And there are already many multi-platform libraries available, including coroutines with some restrictions, but we're going to fix them, standard library, and other libraries, and many more are, have, uh, are developed by the community. So we hope that many more libraries will be available. Surprisingly, <laughs> many people already use this technology, despite it is so far experimental. It's not yet published as stable. But it seems that there is so high demand on this fixing the shared code problem. So many people want to share the code so that there are already some successful stories about using this technology. So these are some highlights from Kotlin Conf that will be this year in Copenhagen. All the talks will be recorded so it will be possible to view them. I just wanted to highlight that it's already in use and in active development, and we hope this technology to be really helpful. So that was all that I wanted to cover today. Multi-platform is something that is in active development right now. We hope it will be very helpful in the future. And all the rest, all my previous topics, are already part of stable language, and you can already enjoy using these features. If you want to learn more, uh, you, can, um, you can try Kotlin online. We have online playground, is a Googleable by Kotlin playground. There is a Quan's set, set of tasks to uh, become familiar with the Kotlin syntax. Also, as kind of advertisement, can mention Kotlin action book that uh, is targeted at Java developers. So it highlights, it describes Kotlin from the perspective of Java developer. Also, there is another book we're currently working on together with Bruce Eckel. And this one is targeted as people un who are not familiar with Java. So it learns, it, uh, it helps to learn Kotlin from scratch. If you already experience developers, probably that's not for you, but for some people who join the team and need to learn Kotlin very fast, it can be recommended. Also, there is Kotlin course at Coursera, if you prefer video course. However, it's in English, and I speak even more faster there, so it, I don't know how easy <laughs> it is to watch, but it has subtitles. So there is, uh, there is the benefit, you can watch subtitles, and the content is available for free if you find, like Coursera wants by default everyone to pay, but you can access videos for free if you just find the audit option. It calls audit, and you can just watch the videos and check, for instance, only the topics you're interested in. The stuff I've covered today, it's all covered in more details in this course using basically the same slides. So you can watch and say, oh yeah, I remember, I've already know it. I, I'm just very beginner to Kotlin. I, I'm, as a backend developer, I, my concern is that, um, is there any performance sacri sacri uh, sacri sacrifice uh, versus uh, Java, so we have a uh, benchmark report 
Ah, in terms of performance, mm. I think the performance of the resulting uh, bytecode is the same yeah. because the bytecode is very similar to to Java. Okay. And uh, in terms of compilation time, I think some people uh, complain about compilation time of a Kotlin code in comparison to Java code, but that's what we are working on. So it's uh, I'm, I don't know the exact benchmarks. It might be a bit slower, mm -hmm. like, I don't know, 10% slower or something. So not, not that noticeable. Mm -hmm. mm, however, we are working on it. On it. Okay. Yeah, but in terms of performance of resulting application, it's uh, the same. OK, thank you. One more question. Uh, do you have any um, product in JetBrains written in Kotlin as a, you know, Dog footing or something? Absolutely, yes, yes. absolutely. You, and can uh, you introduce us. Yes, yes. Uh, there are, at first, it's Kotlin itself. So, Kotlin uh, was a really good example of trying Kotlin uh, in, com in a mix with Java. Because at first, Kotlin compiler was written in Java. And then uh, w we started to convert it slowly to Kotlin, and I suppose there are still some parts written in Java. So there was never a goal to convert it fully, but rather use a test environment for this compatibility story. There are some parts of IntelliJ IDEA written in Kotlin, some new parts, but since the IntelliJ code base is huge, it's small percent, but because new features, some of new features are added in Kotlin. So again, some interoperability story. And also there are other secret projects of JetBrains <laughs> that are written in Kotlin, and uh, th they use actually this uh, JavaScript and multi-platform story and some frameworks. So it, it is used inside JetBrains. I'm a Android developer, and we have Kotlin project, but uh, one thing I feel inconvenient in Kotlin is Kotlin cannot receive lambda when the parameter is declared as a functional interface, like uh, where um, I. There is it's, it's important feature request. We are aware about it. No promises, but there are some plans to fix it. No promise which version it will be supported and how, but we are aware of the, I, I understand that you're talking about some conversions for Kotlin interfaces, uh, some conversions for Java interface work. Initially, uh, it was the idea that uh, you should define function type or type alias, but now it seems that we uh, it's important request, and we know that the community has this request, and uh, I know there are some plans about fixing it, but no no exact date yet. Yeah, but thank you for your question. That's n known <laughs> known pain point uh, of the community, which we are going to fix at some point. But now, because Kotlin has to be backward compatible with the previous versions, it's important to fix it properly so that the old code continued to work, to work correctly, and it's also connected with a new type inference algorithm. So a uh, new type inference algorithm fixes part of this problem. Um, it, uh, it fixes some issues with uh, some conversions for Java types, but for Kotlin types, it's, it's, it's on the plate, yes. I have two questions, uh, mainly about types. Mm -hmm. um, first one is about type inference. I know uh, Kotlin's type inference is very powerful, but uh, there's some, some missing point or lacking. For instance, uh, if a function has two or three type parameters and uh, two of them can be imported, Still, I have to write three type parameters. I want to omit two uh, improbable types, like C++. 
uh, but it's I impossible now. Uh, so, is there any plan to improvement improvement this type of plan? Have to check issue tracker whether it's uh, it's also n another known uh, known pain point, uh, and uh, there is definitely an issue about it. I just uh, not sure when exactly it will be fixed, but yes, it is a known issue that so, uh, sometime will be addressed. Uh, I, we, we can probably, if you're interested, you can go to me afterwards, we can check uh, what is the state of this issue in the tracker. So thank you for your attention. Have a nice Scotland. <laughs>